Colonial Williamsburg, the birthplace of America. For 81 years, it was the thriving capital of Virginia. From 1699 to 1780, Williamsburg was the political, cultural, and educational center of what was then the largest and most influential of all the American colonies. It was here that our country's ideas of liberty and self-government were established by such leaders and patriots as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, George Mason, and Peyton Randolph. Near the end of the Revolutionary War, Virginia's government moved up the peninsula to the safer and more centrally located city of Richmond. For nearly a century and a half afterwards, Williamsburg stayed a quiet college town, home to the College of William and Mary. In 1926, under Dr. W.A.R. Goodwin and John D. Rockefeller, Jr., a restoration began to preserve some of the most historic buildings in the area. The project started with the preservation of a few of the more important buildings, and today covers approximately 85% of the original 18th century capital. Now a major tourist attraction, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation has catered to more than 100 million visitors since 1932. They offer tours of the historic buildings and areas where many people lived in the 18th century. According to some employees and visitors, several of these 18th century people are still around. In August 1701, soon after Williamsburg was decided to be the colony's new capital, an act was passed to construct a brick prison. By 1704, two jail cells were ready for occupants just north of the capital on Nicholson Street. By 1722, the jail was extended to include eight cells, an exercise yard, a courtyard, and rooms for the jailer. Most of the jail's occupants were men and women awaiting trial, or convicts waiting to be branded, whipped, or hanged according to their sentences. The gallows in the back were used for the hangings. Most of the cells were overcrowded and unheated with no plumbing. Many occupants were chained to the walls. From time to time, jail fever, probably typhus, would break out among the prisoners. The most famous occupants of these cells were 15 henchmen of the pirate Blackbeard. Caught in 1718, 13 of them met their end by being hanged at the gallows on Capitol Landing Road. Today, the lower sections of the jail are open for touring, but it's the second story of the jail that is reportedly haunted by unrestful spirits. Employees often talk of voices, footsteps, and doors creaking from above with the building empty. It's not surprising that the souls would haunt a place like this. Being tortured in life has not been known to lead to a restful death. This historical house was built around 1715 and was owned by Sir John Randolph, a distinguished lawyer for his time. John Randolph died in 1737 and left the house to his wife and then to his son, Peyton Randolph. Peyton died in 1775. Following his death, his wife lived in the house for some years afterward. The house was eventually sold out of the Randolph family in 1824. The owner, Mrs. Mary Monroe, served as hostess to General Lafayette during his visit to the United States. The history of the house for the next century and a half is difficult to follow. The house passed through a number of different owners and became known as a house of sadness and tragedy. Many people met strange and untimely deaths there over the 19th and 20th centuries. One William and Mary student died painfully of tuberculosis while he was boarding there. Several children died in the house, and there were at least two suicides over the years, perhaps more. Suicides were only reported as deaths back then. People said it was as if the house was cursed. Today, the house still stands. Over the years, visitors and employees have seen strange things on many different occasions. The most common sightings happened in the red oak paneled bedroom on the second floor. There, the spirit of a deeply disturbed woman who possibly lived there 150 to 200 years ago is periodically seen, apparently trying to warn others of impending tragedy. One of the more recent occurrences happened in October 1962. A Mrs. Helen Hall Mason was sleeping upstairs in the red oak paneled room when she awoke from a deep sleep to a woman 
standing at the foot of her bed. At first, she thought it was her hostess, but could soon tell that it was not. The woman was dressed in an 18th century nightgown and was wringing her hands nervously, looking distraught. When Mrs. Mason sat up in her bed and asked her what was wrong, she got no reply. Mrs. Mason then gasped, noticing that the moonlight which shone through the window shone through the woman as well. Seconds later, the woman vanished. Mrs. Mason said she didn't have the feeling that the woman was there to harm her, but rather to give her a message. She thought the spirit was trying to warn her. Other strange phenomena ranged from sounds of shattering glass in the middle of the night to apparitions vanishing before people's eyes. One instance involved a woman feeling as though someone was trying to push her down a flight of stairs. Employees are hesitant to talk of these happenings, although few who know the house cannot deny that there is a strange feeling about it. Who is the woman in the red oak paneled room, and what is she trying to warn people of? Perhaps she is worried that the house will impose more tragedy on unexpected visitors. Perhaps she's trying to tell us that most of the violence in the house occurred in or near the red oak paneled room. Many experts have tried to explain the strange sounds and sightings that have occurred in this house over the past century and a half, although none have been able to. The public hospital for persons of insane and disordered minds was the first hospital in North America devoted solely to the treatment of the mentally ill. The first patient was admitted on October 12, 1773. Originally one building with 24 cells, the hospital eventually grew to include over 450 patients and seven buildings by 1885. Cells had heavy doors with barred windows, a mattress, a chamber pot, and an iron ring on the wall to which the patient's wrist or leg fetters were attached. Cells in the hospital were reserved for more dangerous individuals and patients who might be treated and discharged. You have been a danger to society, threatening citizens in Spotsylvania County from the courthouse steps, in the streets, and during religious worship. Sir, this is my king. I am superior to George Washington and his cabinet, to Patrick Henry and his council, to Thomas Jefferson and all the gentlemen of Virginia. According to the theories of the 1700s, mental illness was a disease of the brain and nervous system. Treatments consisted of restraint, strong drugs, plunge baths, and other shock water treatments, as well as bleeding and blistering salves. On June 7, 1885, the hospital, then called the Eastern Lunatic Asylum, caught fire and burned to the ground. Two female patients may have died in the fire, however, no remains were ever found. The hospital's foundations, still filled with ash and debris, were excavated in 1972, and reconstruction was approved in 1979. The hospital, however, is not the site for strange phenomena, but the graveyard is. About a mile or two behind the hospital lies the graveyard. Upstanding citizens were buried in separate graves with headstones. Here, the dead were buried in mass graves with no headstone or coffin. Many lived to the end of the lives shackled to a wall and tortured, only to be buried in an unmarked grave. Some residents of the area report feeling watched or uneasy when visiting the graveyard. Others say that they have been touched by something while walking through it, only to find nobody there. Although the reports in this area aren't as common as in other spots, one thing is certain. Most of the people here did not live happy lives. Most of the people here were insane tortured, and are probably not resting in peace. Colonial Williamsburg is a historical town. Many people have lived and died here, and many will continue to do so. Visitors from across the world travel here to see the restored colonial capital the way it once was. Over 300 years of memories haunt the city, in more ways than one.